Right, we're just completing this repair of this um, Aeroshino milk frother with a design pole. And we're going to do the repair quickly. It's not really complicated. And then we're going to do a few tests and just see how it blows up. So it'll be part two is this quick repair. And then part three of this video is, if you're interested, is a test to see whether it's um, got a intrinsic design flaw, which makes it unreliable and makes it end up in landfill so that you buy another one. Um, so here we go. Um, without further ado, let's have a look at the components They're around here somewhere. I haven't seen them yet either. Packet from RS. Oh, radio spares. Get the old mother, mother sucker out of the way. Oh, I put it in plastic ba paper bags. It's like going to a fish and chip shop. Oh, there's the uh, fuses. And there's the thermal fuse. So the, the plan is, you can see the numbers there if you need to get any. I've got nine spares of each because I'm just fixing one Aerochino, which is mine. So I can have some nice frothy milk and 3 amp 250 volt, that's right. And... Uh, SF129R, that's the one that's 133 degree fuse. Let's have a look at them. It's a nice little bag. Yep, 133 degrees, 15 amps. 10 amps. No, 15 amps. I thought it said 10 on the advert, on the listing, but there you go. So, show how a few days and a few beers. And screw your memory and the fuse see if that was in a circuit oh there is a part number on it CRU3A yeah so there is a part number on that one so we're okay as I say I was gonna say if that's in a circuit it'd be a bit um, screwed if it blew and you didn't know what to replace it with it says 3A so the 3A would be a clue now when we put these together I want to put this in series like that but what we mustn't do is this is a Soldering iron is, if I use leaded solder, it'll be 230 to 240 would be the temperature I'd have to use. And of course that would just melt this fuse. So either I'm going to have to solder it for a long way away or put some sort of heat clamp on here to stop the, um, the wire heating up above the critical point at which it will damage this component just by soldering. I could crimp it, but I don't have any little crimps. If you look at the original one here, you can see it's been crimped onto the end of the wire. Bit of crimpy crimpy going on there. Inside there is a crimp. So, actually, let's unsolder that, shall we? Let's put the iron on and unsolder it. That's all that end. That's all that end. Move this out of the way. Now I'm wondering whether the, the diameter of this one is slightly too large to go down that sleeving or not. We'll find out, won't we? We will find out. So straighten her up. Give her a bit of a tweak. And then just pull this out of there. So there's the offending article, and you can see it's been crimped on the end. And they've done that because they don't want to solder it, because soldering it would cause a problem or could call a problem with the device itself, okay? So, will this go down the tube? If not, I'm going to have to go and find a piece of PTFE sleeving, aren't I? Yes, it will. Under duress. It's going to be a tight fit, though. I suppose a tight fit's good, because it'll give more thermal conductivity if it's um, in contact with the tubing itself, providing it doesn't have a problem. So, without further ado, I'll just get some bits together, I'll come back. Yeah, what I've done is just to shorten one end slightly, and I'm just going to wrap that around the um, the thin wire from the fuse around the thick wire from the thermal fuse. And wrap it tightly, like a nice super tight wrap.
It's nice and tight. There's no way that's not going to make a connection. It means voltage. I think this conductor here is silver plated. It looks like it. And this one's just tin plated, but it's tight and it'll make a good connection. Okay. Now, what we need to do is to thread this through this pipe, which I will do presently. I have to get some silicon oil to put on there to make it go through back. Right, what we're going to do is just open up this crimp here with the pliers and then recrimp the new wire into it. So, holding one side, it's like a, a figure eight, you can imagine, it's crimped on both sides. So, we're just opening up the one side to, it's a brass crimp by the look of it. I'm just going to unroll it slightly. There we go. So the old one falls out. And then I'm going to cut this off a little bit because the overall situation is longer. And then crimp that back in again using the pliers properly. This is going to be successful. Might hold it like that. Give it a bit of a squeeze. Should try it. There we go, roll her back over. Okay, roll it back into there until she's in. And then finally, without cutting it or going crazy, give it a final crimp with the pliers there and there. And you can see that's really tight now. Oh, sorry, gone off screen. Really tight now. Okay, so we're going to thread that the rest of the way through. Okay, so it's inside the tube now. We've just got to do this end. So uh, we've got a little bit to spare out then. Push that through a little bit further. And then cut this off near the fuse. We don't want to strain the component. Bear in mind when you're dealing with axial components, if you start yanking on the wire going into the body of the component, it is possible, or in fact quite likely, that you could damage it. So just be careful not to stress the components. When we used to work in the, I used to work in electronics factory making computers, believe it or not, when they, back in the day, and we'd see the occasional failure happening on the production line. We used to make up all the terminals and the computers. They were CPM based, the old competitor, competitor to Microsoft um, MS DOS, and we, my company, chose CPM instead of MS DOS. <laughs> Could have been a different story, but it wasn't. But we used to, uh, all the boards we made were all legged, leg dices with legs on and axial components and there was links and resistors and all sorts of stuff going on there. And um, yeah, this, the placement machine, the components would come on reels, like great big band, we called them bandoliers in those days. Imagine all, you've seen the uh, discrete legged um, axial components that come on a bandolier like these fuses. Well, there you go, there's a bandolier there. That's a bandolier. Hey, Gringo, have you got some resistors for me? So this was, these were on reels, and it had 96 reels, big reels with thousands of components in this machine, and it would, it would, um, the Amistar machine we had would uh, cut it off there, and then deliver this down a pipe by compressed air to a transport station, which is the rubber belt. Go onto the rubber belt, go all the way on, bear in mind these cabinets are about 10 meters long, deliver the component up to the, the insertion head, uh, check the component value, whether it's an inductor or resistor, by clamping on the leads and doing an in-circuit test of the actual component. Then it would go back on its way again, up a rubber belt, all the way to the insertion head, where it would shoot into the head and then two bars would come down and fold, the, sp the, the spacing would adjust correctly for the hole, and then these bars would go down and form those leads and poke them through and bend them down to the right um, vertical spacing to fit the hole, align the whole board on the table and then shove them through the hole and then two cl um, clinchers come up underneath, they were spread to the same position and they would cut and clinch and bend the leads out and that's how they got on the board and it would do something like three components a second and it was noisy this machine but yeah, occasionally you get when it, this clinching, bending thing goes on, 
it could pull those leads there, pull them out, and on some components it would cause weaknesses. And um, that weakness is not specified on the data sheet, and we, we uh, just concluded not to buy a certain manufacturer's makes of components because we would see them, after they were assembled, they're all put onto what we used to call burn-in racks for uh, 48 hours just to find any juvenile failures and often it was these leads being pulled so when you're handling axial components just be aware that some are a bit sensitive to having their leads yanked all right so let's put that in there and crimp, crimp that one in as well So you can use these crimps, you just need a small pair of pliers and a sharp pair of cutters to, to remove them and then you just need to squeeze them back on. And brass will take a couple of forms before it breaks, hopefully. And then I'm going to use these pliers look, with the rounded form to crimp them. And that's on there now, that's perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. Now let's just push the insulation back over the top of that. There we are. So there's our assembly to go back into the unit to be uh, thermal fuse, normal fuse. So let's, without further ado, let's put it back. The body of this unit's obviously got to go, of the thermal fuse has got to go into this clamp to be presented up against the underside of the, uh, of the coffee maker. Of the milk frother coffee maker. Got coffee on the brain, needs some more, don't I? And then uh, just bend this down slightly and then loop it around here. And the same on this side, bend this down slightly. Careful with the leads. Again, about straining the components, you don't really want to do that. Uh, down around that side and then over the top. Just like all my videos, over the top. Okay, so we're back in position, got the fuse and the thermal fuse, and then, uh, where did that wire go? That one went on, on there, didn't it, like that, so it goes through and up and under, up and under, okay, and then this one goes through the PCB, and the hull is not ACL, look, ACL, AC Live, where's the mother sucker, there she is, right, let's give her a bit more temperature on the old soldering machine. 400 degrees, unblock your tip. Yep, you shouldn't perform with your tip blocked, otherwise, I'm sure my solder not up there. It's well blocked up, actually. I don't know what was mother sucking last time, but yeah, there we go. It's all showering all over the floor. Precious metals recovery program under my floorboards, I'll tell you, most of it goes through the gaps. Alright, so just Clean out your hole before attempting an insertion, and away we go. Oh, it'd be handy if you can actually see what I'm doing. Sorry about that. Get carried away. All right, that's just the neutral wire, the blue one. This is, I think this is silicon wire. If I just try and burn it with this solder arm, we'll find out, shall we? Yeah, impervious. That's, so that's good, that's heat resistant sleeving. That one isn't on that sensor. You can only hope, wonder why um, this is a sensor sensing the, um, the temperature. I think this is the switch it off at different temperature settings or when the milk boils and this is the protection and you'd think um, the protection one is actually located where's me whipper steady gone there it is Ooh. <laughs> the sensory one is is detecting under here okay which is underneath where all the whipping and the stirring is going on so you'd think that would be a very cool spot wouldn't you so the question is, 
why did that blow? Did that blow? Um, imagine the, the milk is heating up, so there's heating going on, and this thing's whizzing round, heating up. And you think, ah, oh, it's getting too hot. So the, you think the micro would say, um, would detect the fact that it's overheating, and then flick this relay off and turn the thing off. Um, the trouble with um, a dynamic system like that is, is that the this is registering. It's got some thermal um, inertia, specific heat of this whole assembly here, and so the heat is coming through from the the PCB um, heater assembly. And when you turn the power off, anyone who knows that is when your solder arm's heating up. If you've got a sensor that's not around the heating element, then the and you turn the power off the the temperature will continue to rise and then drop back down as the heat comes through from the element it continues to come through and the thing heats up. So anyway this should be the safety thing which detects the overheating and then switches the relay off and this really should be protection for when um, well for example when the micro crashes the micro has gone is dead you know he's, uh, he's, there's a watchdog there should be a watchdog in there that detects that the micro is not running through its normal um, scanning loop um, and should re reboot the micro and the micro wake up and say hold on a minute I'm overheating let's turn everything off I think the first thing it would do on reboot would be to switch everything off so if the micro crashed then this would this would be ignored and this would continue to heat so it could be um, a design flaw in terms of the thermal um, dynamics of this thing and they've got this wrong it could be fatigue of this fuse because um, maybe if you heat them up to near their um, melting point enough times maybe the melting point drops down or they could become more sensitive to the heat it could be that the micro's gone um, or the micro's locked up or there was a glitch in the mains which caused the micro to lock and then um, yeah it wasn't paying attention so this was the safety device so it'd be interesting to see once this has been fixed, uh, A, if it works or not now, and also B, whether it continues to work. And I might actually put a thermocouple on the heating element on here. You can see the two places where these are de detecting. This one is splodged on right here. Um, Interestingly enough, I think there's a recess in there. There is a recess in that board. I suppose that's to get it closer to the heating element. There's actually a slight recess in the PCB. They've machined a bit away to make it presumably better coupled to the uh, to the temperature of the milk rather than the temperature of the heating element. I've got some heat sink compound here. Have I got a cloth? I've got a bit of tissue. So let's just wipe that off and have a look and see what's underneath. Oh, look, see? That's interesting, isn't it? So underneath where it says that, somewhere, you can't see it, I'm going to have to tip it up. So that's where I just wipe the, um, the heat sink splodge from. And there's no heating element there. So really, that's detecting, and actually there's no recess either. It's just flat with printing, They're printed in, is that copper? No, that's ink. <laughs> um, now the heating element ends there, so that's just the milk temperature detector. It's not necessarily the over temperature detector because the over detect temperature detector is sitting here across this piece here, which is the thermal fuse, thermistor, thermal fuse. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's not detecting the heating element. If you this thing ran away with no heat in it, then you'd be relying from the heat from this to be going through to the um, to the sensor that way. I mean that does feel quite cold, so the thermal conductivity is presumably pretty good. I can't get that off there. I don't know how it's stuck on, whether it's bonded on or what it is. In fact, looking at this more even more carefully now, is look, actually, that's a it's not a PCB. It isn't a PCB. It is a stainless steel base. And then the actual heating element is way wafer thin. It's um probably about 300 microns thick I think that heating element obviously there's an insulation part and then then this on top so yeah the actual heating elements just like a 300 micron or so 
possibly less um, heating elements stuck on the bottom of this steel assembly. Actually, I was just thinking, I was making a jet engine with a, um, a turbocharger. And I think that would make a great input, wouldn't you? I'd just get one of these and stick it or cut that out there and that could be the input to your turbo. Or the output jet. You can have input and output actually, couldn't you? A nice rounded solid steel thing, heat resistant. That'd be quite nice on the front of my turbine. So if this blows up again, it's going to end up in my jet engine using an old turbocharger just messing about in the shed, making lots of noise. In particular, I thought a turbo, I mean, Colin Furs has done it, turbo powered uh, leaf blower. Imagine that, it'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? To hold on to it though. Yeah, um, right, so that's about further ado. Let's just put this thing back together and fire her up and see what she does, shall we? So we need some heat sink compound. It's in here. What have we got? What have we got in this box? Well, we've got the RS one and a piece of wire. Hmm. That's low, temp low temperature mel melting point. Um, and so look, oh yeah, we've got everything here. Look, what else have we got? A box. The treasure of the Sierra Madre. No, it's just an empty box. So what we've got, yeah. We've got the expensive stuff, which is uh, probably 20 times the cost per volume, 30. It's supposed to be high density polysynthetic silver thermal compound. So that's supposed to give you the best bang for your buck. You can see it's horrible, best mashed up um, silver, mashed up silver in a silicon source. So silver and silicon source. Arctic silver, keep away from children, made in America. Made in America. Look, do you believe that? So made in America or labelled in China, you decide. It's got a very nice nummy bit on the end though. So that's a silver one. That's that's actually pretty weighty. It's got some gravity to it. This one is the thermal um, high stability and reliability. This is thermal silicon grease. Uh, so it's 0 0.225 degrees centigrade thermal gradient uh, in centigrade per inch squared per watt. All right. So that one's 0 0.25. 0 0.225. Has this one got anything on it? You see, these these guys don't specify anything, so that's interesting, isn't it? And what have we got on this one? On the radio spares. No, made in China, so it may or may not contain the heatsink compound. It is a tube and it's got something in it. Oh, so that's low temperature solder, that's the um, tin bismuth alloy solder. So my heatsink compound is not even in the tube. I have been. Who's done that? Look at that. I'm going to have a look for my heatsink compound now, back in a minute. Actually, it's quite interesting this stuff. This is bismuth. Tins, uh, bismuth tin solder and it's a low melting point solder so um, bismuth is that stuff that makes those really colourful sort of um, dichroic sort of uh, crystals you see them sometimes in gift shops and things like gold coloured crystals all all, um, all sticking up like Superman's palace on the ice cap but all different colours uh, sort of shimmering in the light and they're very nice and it's bismuth and it's a very hard uh, very heavy metal and um, when alloyed with tin uh, instead of uh, this stuff, which is tin uh, leaded solder, 60 40 lead, so 60% lead, 40% solder, that melts about 220. This stuff will melt about 150, 160 degrees, and it does a perfectly good soldering jobs. So it's, it's very good for um, soldering heat sensitive components and what have you. Very good. So, so. let's find the, uh, the compound then. No, can't find it. It's around somewhere. Someone's borrowed it, you know. Someone has borrowed it and has stuck something back in the box to make me think it was still there. Cunny, eh? Dreadful cunny engineers, you know. Uh, steal your sandwiches and stick a half a house brick in there to make you think you can still be looking forward to your lunch. So anyway, we're going to use the silver stuff. Look, we're going to use the expensive and put a dob of that on there like that. So, a little bit more coupling is required. Coupling is good. 
right so I'm gonna note to self hide comestibles it's consumables I suppose you'd call them right so let's clip this back in here come on Dobby there we are so we've got our um Thermistor jobby wanged onto there with some silver heat sink compound this time, which should improve things slightly. I wonder if putting a bit more on. Nah, I shouldn't think so, would it? And then this is properly pressed up against here. Look, you can see it's making contact. So if this gets above 133, or it's going to get much higher than that space. It by the time the heat has transmitted itself into there, it's gonna it's gonna get uh, a lot more toasty before the fuse blows on the actual board itself. We could do a test but do you know what? I don't know if I can be bothered. So putting the meter on, let's just check that we have, we have contact between those two contacts. I bet we have but I might have damaged something in the meantime. Anyway, so see if we've got contact. Yeah we have. Right, so let's put put her back in the back in her box and then try her out, shall we? Right, let's stick her back in. Can you see that um, button there? Ooh. Hello. Um, that's probably better to take that out and then shove it back in when you've got the thing fully engaged. Oh, damage it. it just pops out like that. Very nice sticky button. And. Uh, Interesting, there's a remnant of a silicon grease on there. Presumably they grease this up, but I haven't done that. Must be the grease for that seal to make that seal engage and disengage nicely. It's a very thick, like Vaseline. Not Mussolini, Vaseline. Right, okay, so button and switch line up, and then these contacts. We've got to go down into these contacts, those two contacts you can see down in the tube. Do we want to do more tests on this before we put it back together? Should we do a destructive test? No, I won't. If it goes again, if it blows again, I'm going to uh, do some analysis on this, but at the moment I'm just going to do repair because I need some coffee. All right. Slide her in. See, we can see what's going on down here, can't you, where it's supposed to be. Where is that switch? There it is. Feels like it's engaged. I think that's it, don't you? You can see the down through the hole, you can see you've got your old switch lined up down there. So I'm just going to get my trilobular screwdriver and give it a twist. Okay, so I just do them up. Push it down. There we are, she's in, she's clamped up all the way around, all right, put the twizzler back in, that needs a good clean isn't that twizzler, you think it'd stay clean when you've been twizzled around like that. Okay. All right, I'm going to go to the fridge, one moment. Okay, so I've washed her out, and I just noticed something actually. I should have RTFM read the manual because uh, look inside there. That's not one cup and two cups. That's max with a certain uh, symbol, and the second level up is max with a another symbol. So is that two different maximums? Maximum for presumably the bottom one is maximum for super frothy, and the top one is maximum for just milk, plain milk, I should think. But, alright, so I washed her out anyway, give her a bit of a clean. Clean out the detritus from my workshop. And I've got some uh, good old English skim, uh, not skimmed actually, full whole milk. Fair for farmers guarantee. We, Every farmer is paid fairly for every pint of milk. Every pint is 100% British. Every cow is well cared for. 
For more information, go to Tesco Pick PL, Tesco PLC dot com. Um, yeah, so basically, Tesco promised to keep every farmer on the borderline of despair, so that they can be ensured that they can get a fair deal for Tesco's. I'd like to see how many p the farmer makes from producing this compared to how many p Tesco make for selling it. The information's there somewhere, but what's the betting that Tesco makes more out of it than the poor farmer who gets up at four o'clock in the morning? But anyway, well done, farmer. Supporting our trust trusted dairy farmers. Well, I just hope they are. I'm sceptical about all that sort of stuff. So I want to fill it to the frothy line then. There we go. Moment of truth coming up. Maximum. Maximum froth. Lid on? No, lid off. Come on, let's do the lid off, shall we? Okay, so I'm connected through a power meter and we are taking, uh, it's taking 0 0.2 watts at the moment on standby. So all the time your Nespresso is plugged in, uh, with the power meter over there, you can't see it. Is taking 0.2 watts, so every every uh, 5,000 hours it costs you 16p, and everyone knows a thousand hours is uh, how many is a thousand hours? A thousand hours must be roughed about 40 days, mustn't it? Anyway, so it is costing you something like sitting there looking pretty on the work surface, but not much, and creating some carbon. So turn it on, ready? So power on there, and. Moment of truth, contact. Is it gonna chooch or not? Yay! Oh, you can't see it at the moment, but there's all manner of little drops of milk flying out the top at the moment. I'm not zooming any further. You can see. There she goes. She's getting properly. It's taking. 560 watts. Actually, that's um, this is 460 to 500 on the base, I think. So, 560 is a little bit over what it should take. But you can see, anyway, it illustrates the point. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this Aeroshi. Now, I should run it for a bit. And if this is part two of the video, which is a fine assembly, and if it fails again, I will do a part three. So you can check the outcome or the um, subsequent performance of this thing later. If there's no part three of this video, then assume it's still working. If it's if there is a part three then I'll, um, it means that it failed again and it might have been the micro crashing or something else but I really do think it was just powered up with no water in or no milk. And there we have it. So we've throth what have we frothed up to? We've frothed up to the second line. We have. We've more or less frothed to the second line. So that's all very good. Good. So we've got good nice frothy milk there. Okay, so that concludes the repair. I mean, if you've been interested in this, um, I'm, anything that's domestic, if someone sends in, I'll fix. And just uh, subscribe on the bottom right-hand corner. You don't have to watch them, but I'd appreciate it, because my mission really is just to help people fix stuff rather than having to go and buy new stuff. Um, if you do take it apart, obviously be careful. Don't power it up or don't plug it onto the base with the, with the mains on, um, because... It could end badly, you know. Unless you know what you're doing, don't mess with mains powered equipment when it's powered up or any connection to the mains whatsoever. So there it is. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that and um, signing off.